How are we good morning? Is everybody hanging in there? I feel like everyone looks tired this week. Like my classes yesterday, everyone has that like, is it spring break yet? Kind of like, look, we're, we're almost there, right? Um, it's like almost halfway through the semester and I feel like it starts to catch up with all of us, right? So it's coming, it's, it's very soon. So, so hang in there. Uh, I had another thought for the way. Uh, so we're gonna, we'll keep going with our, our, our chapter today, but I wanna just, um, I don't think I told you or maybe I did or not, I can't remember. On uh, Thursday, we will have a guest speaker coming in to talk. I, I think I mentioned it already, right? I just wanna uh, make sure I put it out there again on Thursday, we'll have a guest speaker coming in to talk about um, suicidality, the QPR uh, workshop. So that will be on Thursday. So we'll, what we should be able to do today is wrap up chapter nine. And then on Thursday, um, our guest from the health center, Allison, it should be, uh, will be here talking about suicide prevention in chapter seven. So uh, just uh, maybe if you have a chance, look over chapter seven before Thursday. I mean, ideally you read the chapter, but at least take a look at the slides. Uh, she'll probably ask you some questions related to like depression and mood disorders that we covered uh, last week. So just to kind of be thinking about all that, uh, you might want to take notes, the stuff that she covers on Thursday. Um, some of it could definitely appear on the exam, along with the stuff in the in the slides and everything that I'm, I won't be covering since she'll be covering chapter seven. So uh, hopefully that will be helpful. Um, I've never had the, the person who's coming in on Thursday, I've never had her present, but Traditionally, the health center's presentation on this is really helpful and useful. So uh, hopefully it will it will be in line with that and uh, be helpful and, and useful for all of you. And you could put it on an application or a resume or whatever that you did that training. So that will be on Thursday. But before then, uh, we'll obviously finish up with, with chapter nine. Sorry to kind of jump around. Uh, they were supposed to come last week, but they had to reschedule. So at least they can come for the first time in two years. They get to come back in. So that's that's kind of nice. But um, before I get going back on chapter nine, any, any questions or anything at all about like the schedule, the paper part two that we talked about last time, any questions or anything at all about any of that kind of stuff before we get back into this? Just to remind you that, um, again, that paper is due on the 24th. On the 22nd, which is what, two weeks from today, we will have our second exam. So everything before spring break so that you can uh, hopefully again, enjoy, actually enjoy your spring break this year. So um, otherwise, as I said, we'll, we'll get back to this. We talked a lot last time about anorexia and bulimia, right? The two main eating disorders, uh, but we didn't cover this one yet, right? I have that we left off here, but we haven't talked about it. So uh, the last of the three, and this one was added in the last DSM. So this is a relatively new disorder. Uh, it's basically the same as bulimia, but without the purging. There's no compensatory behavior. So that emphasis on this one is just on binge eating, uh, not just in the sense that it's not a lot, but there's no purging. There's no compensatory behaviors that go with it. So people who have binge eating disorder, have frequent binges, but no compensatory behaviors. Uh, and these are the different uh, criteria that you would need to have. I put it in the slide for this one. You have uh, periods of binge eating. So unusually rapid eating, eating large amounts without physical hunger, and often eating until you're uncomfortably full. So people who engage in binge eating disorder eat an incredible amount of food, often ignoring the fact that they're full, oftentimes eating alone, because of embarrassment. So uh, sometimes we call someone who's eating alone, like a closet eater, right? They're eating uh, privately so that nobody sees this behavior that they're engaging in. There's a lot of like disgust and depression or guilt that can sometimes come with these like binge episodes. And the difficult part about this disorder is because there's no compensatory behaviors, people do gain a lot of weight from it, right? If you're eating massive amounts of food, and you're not doing anything to get rid of it, oftentimes it can lead to a lot of weight gain, which can just fuel the feelings of like depression or guilt or disgust that can come afterward. So it occurs on average at least once a week for three months, and there's no pattern of compensatory behavior, right? So no compensating, no purging in any way. So uh, as I mentioned, oftentimes people will gain um, quite a bit of weight from this if they're binging a lot. Uh, I told you all about Kim from Munchausen's when we talked about Munchausen syndrome. Uh, Kim, when I first met her, weighed, I wanna say 360, 380 pounds. 
Uh, but I never saw her eat anything, like ever. Like we'd go out to eat and she'd order like a Diet Coke and nothing else, right? Or every time we go out to a restaurant or eat in her house, I never once saw her eat anything. But obviously she was eating um, and probably eating quite a bit in order to be that size. She later had gastric bypass surgery and now is incredibly thin. Not that I've seen her in 10 years, but she's incredibly thin. Uh, I see her on social media. But she would often do this closet eating. I remember once my partner and I watched her house for her very early in the relationship. And uh, she was like, you got to see her closet, but don't touch anything. It's like, oh, okay. I was like, I'm curious. Let's go check it out, right? Like a little bit of snooping, you know, just a little. Uh, and it wasn't me. It was my partner who let it, right? So I followed him. But the entire closet, there were drawers filled with candy, right? It was almost like my heaven. Like I wanted it all. And <laughs> she's like, don't, she'll know. She knows exactly what's in here. But every drawer in her closet, she had this whole cabinet that was filled with candy and food and all these snacks, literally in her closet, right? Um, and oftentimes people who have this disorder will eat privately. And that was something that she was doing a lot of eating privately rather than in, other in front of other people because she was really embarrassed about it. So uh, that's something that you see a lot with this and then it just becomes this cycle uh, that can become a little bit difficult to break. But again, no, um, no compensating, so it tends to lead to that, uh, to that weight gain. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about causes and treatment, and then uh, I do have a little uh, case study that we'll do at the end just to kind of apply it and practice it a little bit. But when we talk about the, the causes of eating disorders, we talk about it as a multidimensional risk perspective, right? That several factors can combine together to make somebody more vulnerable. Now, you could say any disorder is this way, but we see it a lot, especially with eating disorders, that several factors have to kind of build upon each other in order to make somebody more vulnerable to this. And so there are psychological, interpersonal, biological, and cultural and societal factors, and we'll talk about each one. Some, uh, some of the psychological factors that people can have, um, and there can be a whole host of them, but we'll just talk about a few. Uh, very common that people feel inadequacy or a lack of control, low self-esteem, and a lot of these kind of go together. People feeling very inadequate, they can't control the things in their life, but they can control what they put in their body or what they take out of their body. A lot of eating disorders is actually thought to be correlated heavily to control um, more than anything else, right? I, I can't control the things in my life, but I can control my body. I can control my intake and my outtake of food. Uh, low self-esteem, right? Feeling inadequate or feeling inferior, very, very common. Um, anxiety or loneliness, anxiety, you can have depression, loneliness, Right. Oftentimes, there's a lot of anxiety and depression and feeling empty or lonely um, that can be very strongly correlated uh, with people having eating disorders. And then um, cognitive disturbances. Right. So negative thoughts about yourself, right? Like very black and white thinking, um, negative assumptions about yourself. Uh, being overly worried about how other people are viewing you, some of the like negative automatic thoughts that maybe somebody is having, all of these are very common psychological factors that play a big role in maybe somebody being more vulnerable or developing uh, an eating disorder. Right? A lot of correlation with like depression. Depression and uh, eating disorders tend to be very correlated or a lot of comorbidity, meaning they occur together. Not, a, not always easy to tell which caused which. Like it might be that someone has depression uh, because of an eating disorder. Maybe somebody has an eating disorder that's exacerbated by depression. It can be a little bit difficult to figure out which came first, but they, they tend to go together a lot. Yeah. Yes, so inadequacy is the first one. And then lack of control. So the next one, um, also really big, inter, uh, interpersonal factors over here. Well, interpersonal factors means other people, right? looking at the interactions that you have um, with others. 
So uh, parents' attitudes tend to be a big one. I think we talked about this a tiny bit last time, right? That the things that your parents and family say to you and like instill it, like the family culture that you have around food can definitely play a big role in your vulnerability to this, right? Like if your parents are saying stuff to you, like you really shouldn't eat that, or are you really going to eat all of that? Or oh, I don't know, you know, like little messages like that, we pick up on them, right? Those are things that tend to seep in over time. Uh, so those like interactions in the family culture, yeah. the culture in your family around food. Now, my partner's family uh, has a very difficult culture around food, right? Her dad has had a gastric bypass surgery. Her sisters, her, both of her sisters, Kim and her other sister, have both had gastric bypass surgery. Her mom is perpetually on weight loss medication. Like the whole family has this culture around uh, weight loss. And so my partner's like the only one with like a full stomach in the family, like everyone else's stomach has been medically shrunk down. And so we go out to eat and it's like, none of them can eat anything. Like you eat like three bites and then they're full. They're often all getting sick from food because they can't, they eat more than their stomach can actually hold. There's a really like negative and toxic culture in their family related to food and weight and that kind of stuff. It does like play a role. My partner often feels like she's the only fat one in her family, her words, not mine, I think she's perfect, right? But she oftentimes has this like, I'm like the only one who's really heavy because everyone in her family is so obsessed with weight loss, right? So it's um, something that again, can play quite a role right? when your family or like your partners are all having these messages that are kind of being internalized. Being teased or bullied. So when people are teased or bullied, especially as a child, um, around their weight or around their body image, this can also play a really big um, role. Or any kind of a history of abuse. Now, kids are really, uh, kids can be mean, right? <laughs> like they're wonderful and they're sweet, but they have a, a habit of uh, telling you the truth in the harshest way. Right, um, and I don't think they mean anything by it. It's just uh, they don't have as much of a filter as we do as an adult. But uh, when kids are teased quite a bit about their weight or their size or their food choices, those messages get internalized. And I'll tell you, uh, as a parent, I was ready to go to jail like three years ago to protect one of my kids from teasing. Like my partner and I were like, who's it gonna be? Who's gonna, who's gonna take out this little kid? Who's going to jail? Um, and we didn't. But I wanted to, like, I wanted to be like, I'll wait for you in the parking lot. Like, I was so mad at this little kid, right? I know, it's so, I shouldn't say that, but I, I felt it deeply. But there was this little girl named Addison. I hate Addison. <laughs> right. Addison, like, this bully, my poor daughter, my daughter who's nine, Kaya, she has always been a little bit, like, bigger, right? She was born at, like, nine and a half pounds. She and I like to eat, right? Like, again, I think she's perfect, but she's always been a little bit, like, heavier set. Right, a little bit taller than all her peers. And in kindergarten, this little girl started bullying my daughter um, about her lunches, like saying, you shouldn't eat that. You can't eat that. Like if you eat that, you're gonna be fat. You're already fat, like all these things. Right? And we didn't notice it for a little while. Like we're very observant, but like we didn't pick up on it because we're not at school with her. But she kept coming home with her lunch, like uneaten. And like after a, like three or four days of this, we're like, why aren't you eating your lunch? And she wouldn't tell us. She's just like, oh, I, I was wanted to play. I'm not hungry. But she was a kindergartner. She didn't have a lot of like, she didn't communicate it well to us at the beginning. And then it lasted like three weeks, four weeks. Like, Angel, you got to eat your lunch. Like, why aren't you eating your lunch? It's really going to like catch up to you. And then it finally came out after like a month that this little girl, <laughs> this little girl, Addison, uh, she now has another Addison. Addison in her life, and I like, don't like this Addison, even though it's a totally different Addison. Like, no, different kid. But uh, after a month, it came out that this girl was telling her all this stuff. Like, you can't eat it, you're fat, teasing her, and then other girls would gang up and tease her as well. And like, we had a meeting with our teacher, and it became this whole huge thing. And again, we were like ready to go to jail. I was like, I'm going to sit out there and pick on Addison. But, I mean, what can I do to like make her insecure? You know, don't be, don't be mean, right? But 
Uh, that kind of stuff is so hard. Kids internalize that stuff so deeply. You know, my daughter would come home and be like, how do I do sit-ups so that I can get rid of my tummy? Like at five, like a five-year-old little girl, like having those thoughts, like it starts really, really early. And those messages are very much there. Uh, so being teased or bullied based on like your weight or anything um, about your appearance can have some long-term effects, especially on uh, things like eating disorders, if they're specifically teasing you about weight. But uh, anyone have any like comments or thoughts about these things, things in your family or family cultures or like other people, any, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I just lost it. Just That's okay. <laughs> if it comes back, <laughs> feel free to raise your hand again. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Sure, right. You can overcome um, any disorder, right? Like you can find a way to cope with it and, and deal with it. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the, the key to it, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, is to find out the root of it and kind of work through that a little bit. Uh, but yeah, definitely. The, the tricky thing with eating disorders is, again, people often have to eat, right? And so um, this can often just be a reoccurring trigger for people. Uh, so, yeah, but you know, because when you learn better ways of like um, thinking about yourself and thinking about the food or dealing with whatever triggered it, oftentimes people can be really successful in navigating this. Or you end up with, you know, a partner who finds you attractive the way you are rather than saying like, you know, hey, that outfit used to fit you or you're going to lose some weight or maybe you should start going to the gym, those little things like that. Um, you find somebody who doesn't feel that way, like all those little things will help. So yes, you can definitely um, overcome that. Yeah. Isn't it time to go? Then the way that I think about it, um, any person can see it a different way that they all their own perspective. So in a family where they might have not thought of those comments, they'll still find a way to if they really wanted to or subconsciously uh, and looking for uh, looking for these things. Doesn't it kind of I don't want to say matter less, but doesn't it mm, have less of an effect if they're subconsciously looking for this and the family might not say anything, but, or like there might not be one of those factors and it's just all like they're looking for it. So it's not even there and they're kind of, oh, we, we talked about it and it was like looking for something they'll make, they'll, they'll find a way to find it. Sure. So if there's no teaching, no family, no, no history, no any of that. And the kid, like, you know, recognizes that as um, abuse, as whatever. How would you, how would you go about uh, not fixing, but kind of changing that perspective? Sure. Yeah, and that stuff can happen. Sometimes people develop disorders with none of these things, right? Like these are the common things that tend to contribute. But then you have times where people have a very supportive, loving family, and you know there aren't any of these factors or the others that we'll talk about, and they still develop it, right? And so. In those cases, like sometimes it's it's education or doing things like, you know, to build self-esteem or build confidence, uh, you know, looking at those automatic thoughts that maybe somebody has. Because typically if they're having um, struggles with an eating disorder, there's something fueling it, right? Like something, and it might be hard to figure out what it is if there's nothing obvious. But once you can figure that out, then you can try and tackle it and work through it. So I think that's the the key, maybe somebody doesn't feel good about themselves and the only thing that's struggling with maybe is low self-esteem. And so it's manifesting as an eating disorder or it could be manifesting as anxiety or depression. And so trying to find that root is really a, you know, your best bet, but that can be tricky to do when there isn't anything obvious, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, these things can happen in absence of all of these factors, but it's typically a combination of these, but it doesn't always have to be, sure. Yeah. My dad, who's from that, so like the chickens on my dad's side will just have like a huge thing about eating. We have only low fat, only low sugar, or like in my entire family, we're like athletes. And so when it came to my dad, like me, ever since I was little, he'd get mad if my mom bought like not low sugar applesauce. Sure. Or like apple juice grits. And it like went on for a really long time. And like, it's really like good about body image. And so for a while for like me and my sister it turned into this um thing where we didn't really realize that we had an eating disorder until we like went to therapy mm -hmm. and then i like found someone who didn't tell me those things and like actually loved me for who i was and that made me like 
kind of realize all of the stuff that had happened during sure. the entire life. And mm -hmm. it's like, then it kind of goes back into it. I don't know. Just forever. Yeah. It comes back up once you're like healed and healthy. Mm -hmm. Like where it comes from. Well, that's the hard thing with these disorders, right? Is some of those messages are so, they can be so subtle. Like you said, you had this family culture around food that you didn't necessarily realize was problematic until later. Right. And oftentimes that happens to us when we're adults and we're actually like old enough to see a bigger picture. We're like, oh, wow, that's not quite how I thought it was. Right. Or like things were a little bit uh, more complicated. And then it might just seep in for you your whole life. You might view like, like you said, applesauce, right? Like with too much sugar in a different way. Right. Just because that was something that was there. Right. Uh, yeah. And these are complicated, which is why they're so difficult to treat. It's just, it's so pervasive. I and mean, we eat, most people eat three times a day, you know, and so and then you have all these messages for years and years and years, and it can be so subtle. I mean, family cultures around food don't have to be negative. Like we all have one. Like my family's culture around food was all about desserts. Like, I mean, I'm sure that's really shocking to all of you at this point, right? But my family, like everything was about dessert. And I remember when I first met my partner, like her family has a lot of people who have diabetes in it. They don't eat dessert. They do now after like 18 years of me being in the family, like now they bring dessert to everything. I've trained them well, right? But in the beginning, it was like, we finished dinner and I'd be like, where's dessert? They wouldn't have one, right? It was so sad, right? But every family has that culture and it can be so subtle and it might not be problematic at all, but those messages tend to persist for us because you spend so much time with that core unit um, over the course of your life, right? Sure. Like culture and people. They they're like Italian. They make like really really good food and have like they sit down for dinner every night. What time do they have food? No, I'm just saying. <laughs> <just kidding. laughs> and like they like accept things that turn really well. And, like taught me how to cook. Sure. And, like, how to like accept food mm -hmm. in this way, and it's honestly been like great. I gained like so so many pounds from them, but like I love it because <laughs> it's like actually good yeah. food, and it's like an actual like nice family. Mm -hmm. And different cultures are so different around food too, right? Like, um, you know, you mentioned like a big Italian family where food so, tends to be something that's really celebrated and brings people together. They tend to have a very um, stereotypically different like view of food. Right? My partner's grandma, every time I see her, she's like, you're too thin to eat. And it's like always shoving food at me. I'm like, I'm so full, I'm just shoving more. Right? And every culture and every family is different. Sometimes it's so obvious. And sometimes it can be a little bit yeah. My dad grew up really poor as a kid. He would eat like for breakfast cornmeal, which is like a powder, and they would put the milk in it with their cereal. Yeah. He had seven other siblings. His mom was a single mom. He did grow up with a lot. My mom grew up the exact opposite. She had four other siblings, no, five other siblings, but her mom and dad like worked around the clock and they made a lot of money. So kind of like my dad grew up. Like low sugar, low carb, didn't eat a lot, was super thin his whole life, was in sports his entire life. So mm -hmm. he was just super thin. My mom grew up kind of different. She grew up, you know, she kept her own corn dogs as a kid and she, you know, had a, her mom instilled a really positive body in which mine and her mind. So I grew up on with two spectrums. My dad who was like sports, you know, and then every time I wanted to get an extra plate of food, he would always say, like, Well, you can't eat that. Like, but like you said, like, are you really going to eat all that? Yeah. And it, my mom was the exact opposite. She was like, have more, have more. Like, right here, we just went to sports for four hours, like, eat, eat, eat. And sure. so that was really difficult for me to balance when I started growing up. was like, do I money? Do I eat a lot? Mm -hmm. And so having to unlearn certain things was really difficult. And I see, like, in my, like, peripheral vision, I see people nodding. I mean, that's so common, right, that your parents might have, like, polar opposite. You grew up with two parents, right, that they might come from such different backgrounds. And sometimes that balance is in a beautiful way. And other times it, compete, it makes competing messages that can be really confusing. Yeah. It's important to mention that with parents' attitudes, it can also be perpetuated through uh, positive reinforcement. Yeah. Where, like, when I was trying to lose weight, my, uh, my family was trying really hard to be supportive. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, that's really good. You're eating less with weight. But it ended up just perpetuating it because I wanted to eat less because that was getting that was getting approval and positive reinforcement. Yeah. And just kind of spiral. Oh, well, that's huge, right? And so those messages, right, uh, are often directly connected to conditioning and reinforcement, right? And somebody says, Wow, you look really good. Or like, I love that you're being so careful with like your choices, right? Those things they reinforce it. They only fuel that behavior additionally. Um, and they make it 
that it could even be more subtle than that. Like the picture that they have in their wallet or the picture that they have on the phone is when you're thin, not versus how you are now, right? Like those little things, we notice them, right? Like we all pick it up. Um, and the, the reinforcement piece is massive, right? That's definitely a big piece. Yeah. Um, both my parents have eating disorders. So um, they've been pushed on me kind of sure. my whole life. Like what, like, I think a year ago, my dad, it's not, not as subtle as, but he, he said, you're getting big. You need an eating disorder. And I was like, well, yeah. that was really nice of you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, yeah. So it's been, and like, I was bullied as well for, uh, wait and then I don't know why like I like as a child in elementary school I, I thought I was like huge I thought I was super big and I was because I was bullied and my parents and just the way they were and it got uh, like the eating disorder I got pushed on like it got so bad I think my at like at 11 I was 48 pounds and um the doctor was like I don't I don't care what you eat you have to eat something yeah so anything anything else Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that you mentioned that, right? It doesn't always have to be subtle. And it's really unfortunate that it can be that way, right? But I mean, sometimes it's very blatant and obvious, right? And, and But those messages, whether they're subtle or blatant or like mixed, right? we internalize them, right? Because they're coming from people who, you know, are supposed to accept us and love us no matter what, um, being our parents, right? Or siblings or whoever that might be. And we internalize that stuff, right? And it can be one of the factors that can contribute to this. Your family culture plays a huge role in a lot of different things, um, especially uh, as we're talking about this here. Uh, the biological stuff is, is a little bit less uh, because, you know, by, by definition, it can't be the whole, the whole um, picture, but I can write a few things up here for that too. Like this. Every now and then, I just want to keep erasing and see if at what point somebody says something. <laughs> like, anyway, I'm sorry. Only in this class because of our, our covered things that we're covering. But uh, biological stuff too. So things that are biological, uh, you know, this can be somewhat genetic, tend to run in family. But it could also be that you've learned it, right? So that's really hard to, to distinguish, right? Is it something that you've... Uh, inherited in a genetic like hereditary sense or is it something that you learned through watching um, that family culture and environment we just talked about but there does tend to be a little bit of a genetic element to it um, the hypothalamus is the big structure in the brain that plays a role in regulating hunger and food and like how much we eat um, and functions related to eating and so there's some thoughts that there might be you know issues with like the hypothalamus in somebody who struggles with an eating disorder, but it can't be exclusively due to that. Um, but that might be one of the factors that's kind of exacerbating or contributing. Uh, but we look at a lot of like biological factors that might play a role, uh, but it can't be the whole picture, right? But it can definitely contribute. The last one is a really big one, cultural and societal factors. Now, this is one that plays a, a big role for people as well. In addition to our family culture, um, the world that we live in, also can play a heavy role. I mean, think about the media and the body types and things that you see in the media. They're very narrow. So we could um, write up here, narrow definitions of beauty. Right, what do we define as beautiful? All right, and for women, stereotypically in our culture, beauty is defined as being really thin. Right, like being thin equals being attractive. Um, stereotypically, for women and for men, stereotypically, it's being a little bit bigger, more muscular, right? And so those definitions of beauty can play a big role. Like we see them, we internalize them, and when we don't see people who look like us, that can lead to lower self-esteem and lead to some of the other things that we already covered. So there's narrow definitions of beauty, cultural norms that we have. Right, the norms that we have about weight and attractiveness, uh, we tend to value physical appearance very heavily in our culture, uh, maybe over more like internal uh, characteristics like personality or inner strength or emotionality. We tend to value a lot of physicality and physical appearance in our, in our society. Uh, and we glorify um, thinness quite a bit. Like thinness is kind of like the paradigm that we have, again, especially for women, but women tend to be the ones who are, are most affected by these, not always, but, but stereotypically. 
And so we see a lot of like cultural factors playing a role. And if you open any pop culture magazine, right? And I used to do this um, as like an activity, but if you open any pop culture magazine, just look at the ads that are in it. It's like everybody is airbrushed. Everybody looks the same. Uh, you know, like there's a very, very like common body type that you see. And again, when you don't see people that look like you, that tends to seep in and kind of create issues with self-esteem, which can fuel some of the other things that are up here. And I think most of us know that the people that you look at in ads aren't real. That's not what they actually look like, right? Like if you've ever seen a celebrity in real life, like they oftentimes look nothing like the person that they do like on the street, right? Because they have so much makeup. They've been done up so incredibly. And uh, Dove, like the, the soap, right? Dove soap, like put a whole um, campaign out years ago trying to raise awareness about this. I'm sure most of you have seen it. I'll play it for you because I think it's worth watching. Uh, it's only about a minute, but they show you what somebody looks like before um, they've done any makeup or editing and what they look like after. And like, so the, the raw product, right? The raw person and then the ad that you see are so different, but we see the ads and that's the message that we internalize. But here, I'll, I'll play it for you. But I think it's uh, interesting. Just how much they digitally alter that individual, right? Like they make her look as good as she can look with makeup and then like make her eyes bigger, right? Then make her neck longer, like things that you couldn't change with makeup, right? Like they digitally alter her completely. The person that you see on that billboard looks nothing like that at first person, right? But that is the product that we see that we all internalize when we drive by it or see it in a magazine or see on in the media. And those like constant bombardment of things like that um, do tend to seep in a little bit to us, right? And then there's also a lot of messages also about um, attractiveness and uh, makeup and like all of the things that have to come with being like thin and attractive that we also tend to internalize. So just, it's kind of a combination of all of these things working together that people have a lot of these different factors going on, which can build to make them more vulnerable um, to an eating disorder. And these tend to start early, but they can appear at any point during life. Um, the most commonly, as we said, like 14 to 18 years old. Any other like comments or stories or thoughts or questions? Anything else here? Yeah. My dad. Uh huh. And so that also went into his mood for sure because he was just around his way in McDonald's like for like 10 years. After, like as soon as he turned 18, he was like a teenage thirty. Uh -huh. And so that for him was also putting that on this of like how the other models would be like they wouldn't. So he'd be like, you shouldn't. You should stop eating. It's good to lose a few pounds, so you don't need to eat that. Yeah. So it that like the modeling is like mm -hmm. how do you like push these through? Sure. Yeah. That um, that additional like cultural like presence of like a culture of modeling, right? Definitely. Think we sort of a culture of athletics, or like you know, being an athlete. You know, all of those things together it makes sense why you would maybe have some of those messages being internalized. Right, that's a lot of different cultures combining together. Right. Anybody, anybody else? Yeah. Um, I grew up poor, and my dad, uh, he's very much a military man. Mm -hmm. Even though he went to a camp for four years, he just like, applies that. And so his perception of eating is if you don't finish everything on your plate, yeah, not done. And my mom's like very much save all of the food possible in the house. Mm -hmm. So I grew up. Thinking that I had to finish everything on my plate. That sure. Everything. So I like would go to school and like interact with other people, and they didn't finish their food. I would get very confused most of the time mm -hmm. because I was like, "What are you doing? Can't we waste all our food?" Yeah. It was just a very odd experience for me, like figuring out that you don't you don't have to finish everything. Mm -hmm. You can just stop when you're full. Mm -hmm. So it's just like an odd growth. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that, right? There are so many, I mean, it doesn't always have to even be in the realm of this, just other messages around food, right? Did anyone else grow up in a, just by show of hands of family, you have to eat everything on your plate? Like a couple of, like several of you, like uh, mine too. It was like, you cannot get up from the table until everything is off your plate. And it wasn't until I was way older that I was like, wow, I can actually not eat everything and that's okay. Like, it's not wasteful. If I'm full, I don't need to eat to the point where I'm sick. But uh, I mean, really, really common, especially when people come from, you know, places where maybe like food was scarce or like money was tight, like you need to, you need to eat everything. 
go back a couple of generations, like our grandparents or like your great grandparents who grew up in the depression era. It's like you eat everything that's there because you don't know when it's coming again. You don't know, you know, it costs you money. So it's, it's really like the messages around like what you eat and don't eat and, and meals are just so complicated in so many different directions, right? I, I love that you, that you mentioned that. Yeah. I was born with schizophrenia, which basically meant that I had to get surgery like uh, right when I was born, mm -hmm. like a couple of months after. And um, anything I would eat, I would throw up. Sure. Would and that would go even after the health. My mom told me that she thought I just got used to it. Mm -hmm. Like my body was just like, eat it, throw it up. Like, so as I grew up and as, as it kind of developed, my body is now so sensitive to like spices. Which is really, you know, unfortunate because I'm my family's like Israeli. Mm -hmm. so use a lot of this, a lot of very strong anything. So um, I grew up, and now anytime I eat any of these things that's like that any type of flavor, sure. and my brother thinks that I'm like flavorless, like I hate flavors. <laughs> um, I would, I would either feel very nauseous or throw it up. Sure. And it's kind of like I don't know if you can call it an eating disorder because it was just when I was young it was nothing really caused that's why I kind of wanted to ask you that sure that question of, is, is if you were born with something that you you know you know there wasn't like a psychological a psychological thing after it was just your body just got used to it yeah which I guess can go with every, every other eating disorder mm -hmm. would that be categorized as a eating disorder or more of like a bodily eating that sounds much more like a like a medical condition yeah. to me, right? And and so uh, you know we talked about reinforcement, right? Like reinforcement is operant conditioning, right? That people like reward and punish you for the things that you do or don't do, and that can that can shape you. That's much more classical conditioning, right? Like your body uh, responds in a negative way to like spicy food, and that wasn't necessarily your choosing. It was just like a, an association that happened because of your medical condition when you were younger, and so that kind of stuff can can linger right it can linger your whole life through and i would say that's much more medical or like driven at least by like something that started medical than than psychological though you could it could go one way but um it sounds like it was much more like on the medical medical side of things right not that that couldn't evolve into something more but the fact that it's not it's not conscious it's more like your body's like automatic reaction seems more like medical and, and, and like classical conditioning than than uh, like an active decision, right? Yeah. So people who have to like maintain a certain weight, so they don't think they like one meal a day or two meals a day. Does that have, like end up affecting your metabolism? Um it could right over time you can you can change your metabolism a little bit, right? Like by exercising, by changing what you eat, um through looking at certain substances and, and so on. Uh so, you know, and there are a lot of people who make that choice to maybe eat one meal a day or like intermittent fasting and then eat periodically or, uh, you know, maybe you're trying to like to maintain a certain weight. And so, yeah, you can alter those things over time uh, to a degree, right? Like we all have kind of an inborn metabolism. If you do exercise or eating different things, you can definitely alter it a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, it could, it could over time. Yeah, so I did, I did monitoring for three years. Until about two years ago, uh -huh. and my agent told me that you have to stay within this certain sure. range. And since then, I've been thinking about to eat breakfast without throwing up mm -hmm. and rarely eat lunch. Mm -hmm. so it's just kind of like eat mm -hmm. breakfast. And no matter how much I eat now, I can't be hungry. Yeah, and like those things, like if you eat a certain way for long enough, it almost becomes like your new norm. Right. Uh, and I was sharing this with my class yesterday. Uh, I have really, really high blood pressure, right? And I don't want to take blood pressure medication. So my doctor, like six months ago, was like, you have two choices, right? You can lose some weight and or you can take blood pressure medication. And I was like, I don't want to take blood pressure medication. It's really awful. So I started like going on a, like I went on a diet. I've been on a diet for like six months. I've lost 28 pounds, right? Oh no, <laughs> thank you, thank you, right now. Uh, and like that's been so hard for me because I love food. Like I love food way too much, probably. But like at this point, after like six months, like my, my mentality around food has shifted a little bit. Like, and, and it can happen a little bit if you get used to eating one way. 
for in a positive or negative or even neutral direction, right? You can end up kind of shifting your stock a little bit, right? And so um, that can be both good or bad. But like if you stop eating breakfast for years, then you might not crave breakfast anymore, right? Or if you stop eating lunch for years, you might be able to eat breakfast and dinner and not be hungry for it. So you can change the habits and patterns and, and so on, uh, you know, through the choices that we whether they're good or bad, right? That's a little subjective, but like they can easily shift over time. Uh, and it sounds like that happens for you. Yeah. And you said substances can cause uh, an attack when someone can be affected. Sure. So like oftentimes when people uh, people take weight loss medications that speed up uh, speed up like your metabolism a little bit, like um, you know, they're often not permanent changes, but like through exercising and gaining muscle mass mm -hmm. um, can change your metabolism. Right. And so uh, oftentimes people will do that kind of stuff, right? They will exercise excessively so that they're burning more calories throughout. Uh, and that's something that you might see as part of like bulimia or some of these as well. Okay. Uh, a few other thoughts from uh, thoughts about treatment for the two, and then we'll do um, this little case study that I have for you. Uh, treating anorexia and bulimia are slightly different, right? They have slightly different goals, but there's a lot of overlap. So with anorexia, because a person is by definition underweight, right? The, the first goal is traditionally to restore that person to a healthy weight. Now, this is really difficult to do if somebody has been fighting being, you know, a quote, healthy weight or a quote, normal weight um, their whole life. And so like you saw in the video, um, I showed you that little promo, you know, sometimes this can involve like feeding tubes or like a lot of like coach, coaching in order to get somebody to eat something. But trying to get somebody up to a weight where they're no longer like medically in danger is oftentimes one of the first goals. And this might require hospitalization or like a treatment program, um, depending on the individual. But trying to get somebody up to a healthier weight and then trying to treat the psychological issues that are like related to the disorder, finding the root of the disorder. Is it rooted in psychological factors like depression and low self-esteem? Is it rooted in family messages? Is it a combination of things? Where is it coming from? and then trying to treat those underlying issues. And then doing a lot of things to try and reduce or eliminate um, things that would cause relapse. Are there friends that you hang out with that tend to be toxic for you, right? The people that you hang out with, are they like supportive? Are they good, like a good presence or a good like, uh, like resilient factor? Or are they giving you messages that are gonna cause you to relapse, right? And looking at all those things, are, what are the triggers for you? Right? If somebody is triggered into like disordered eating because of stress or anxiety, then how do we manage stress and anxiety? So looking at those underlying factors and trying to reduce or eliminate anything that might trigger somebody uh, back into that situation. Maybe it's a certain person, it's an environment, um, it could be anything like that. Um, with bulimia, you have to break the cycle. Right? So bulimia was a very cyclical disorder, right? You binge and then you purge. So getting people to establish kind of healthier eating habits, helping them to stop when they're in a binge, to identify when you're in a binge and understand what that looks like. So then you can hopefully stop it and, and trying to establish more of like a balance, right? Um, and it might be that you literally have to have somebody binge and then you sit with them and don't let them purge. It's very similar to like what you would do with OCD, uh, where you would have somebody touch something that was contaminated, but then you don't let them wash their hands, right? And it causes them stress and anxiety and they might be really emotional and, and struggling, but you work through it and you break that cycle. A lot of therapy, right? Individual and group therapy. Group therapy tends to be really helpful for eating disorders because what it does is it makes you feel like you're not alone, right? If you have a whole group of people struggling with eating disorders, they're all gonna understand how profound it might be if you ate a meal last night and you didn't throw it up. Or, you know, you had like a positive like interaction with food in some way, right? The average person might not understand, you know, how difficult it was for you to eat a piece of pizza and not get rid of it, right? Or not purge it in some way versus the people in that group might. So it creates this feeling of like solidarity and I'm not alone, other people understand, you know, I'm not the only one dealing with this because sometimes when we're struggling with an issue, we feel like we're the only one, like we feel alone. And so group therapy can be really, really helpful. Behavioral therapies look a lot at like journaling, right? Uh, what are the triggers? How can we change the reinforcers or the punishers? How can we maybe reassociate, right, things and, and teach you a different way through conditioning? 
sometimes antidepressant or anti-anxiety medications, right? If the underlying issue is depression or anxiety, let's treat the depression or anxiety and see if that also alleviates some of the eating disorder um, like symptoms. So if treating the underlying conditions can also play a really big role. And then uh, again, it tends to be really effective. Like these things can be so helpful, but a lot of people do relapse as we've talked about throughout um, just because of how complicated that relationship uh, with food can be. So um, a, lot of, a lot of things to try and find the root of it, establishing better habits, getting people up to a healthy weight, oftentimes therapy, sometimes medication. Uh, and these things, again, wildly helpful, but um, it tends to be something that's ongoing rather than like a one-time um, treatment. Uh, I have a couple of these uh, just suggestions if you were interested in learning a little bit more. There's a couple of books that are like really easy pop culture reads um, related to this. And then a couple of documentaries um, as well, like some of them on Netflix or some in the library, just if you wanted to know more, um, you know, uh, just to, to share that with you. And then as I said, what I wanna do uh, for the time that we have left, is I have this little uh, case study that, um, that I found and kind of edited down a little bit. Um, this is gonna be a, a participation exercise. So what I want you to do is, uh, I have enough for each one of you to have one. So I'm gonna give you each one, but you only need to turn one in per group. So if you wanna get into a group of like two, three, four people, you can work on it together. But I'm gonna give you each one so you can read it on your own. Feel free to mark it up and, and write on it whatever you would like to do. But whichever page you decide to turn in, make sure all of your names are on there. Your first and last names. So what you're gonna to want to do is read through, read through the study, and then there's a couple of lines in front of that. Yeah. Well, everyone. So take a few minutes, read through this. I don't know. And you can totally build in your response. That's fine. So again, when you're done reading it as a group, um, on the back, you'll answer those four questions. You can bullet your responses. It doesn't have to be like written out in sentences, uh, but I'll give you a little bit of time and then we'll talk about it together.
So when you're done, feel free to discuss as a group, get some thoughts down on the back and, and get all your names on there contained as well. Yeah, it's a big 